God, for the grand privilege of being able to stand here together and worship your name. For God, you were desiring those that would worship in spirit and truth, Lord, and you've called us unto that place. By your grace, Lord, you've drawn us. You placed something within us before the foundation of the world that would ensure that we could respond to the call. And you've placed us here, Lord, this morning to sing your praises. And we want to say thank you, Lord, for it's a grand privilege. God, as we turn our hearts, Lord, to your word, I just pray that you would come, Lord, like only you can and that you would break the bread of life. God, that we would see you in the breaking of bread and recognize you in the way you break the bread. God, that we might all be fed from your hand, Lord, and we might go here strengthened and equipped that our lives might please you, Lord, and we might live our purpose in this life for your glory. Take preeminence among us. Take preeminence in every heart and every life. May you drive away every spirit that would try to hinder. May it be barred in this place. May your Holy Ghost have free reign to move as you wish. Bring us up higher, Lord, and let us see more clearly than we ever have before. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And God bless you. It's good to be here this morning. If you could take your Bibles and just turn to the book of Matthew, I'd like to look at a portion of Scripture. I want to say uh, we appreciate your prayers, praying for us while we were gone. We had a, a very blessed time out in Oregon. We had a good set of meetings over the weekend, and we were able to baptize Sister Esther, the sister from California. And so it was wonderful. We met her and spent some time with her. This evening at the communion service, I'll share more of the testimony. There's a, several details I want to go into. What God had done was just amazing to me. Only God can move the pieces on a chessboard like he does. And it's just amazing when you watch him do it. So I would like to share that with you tonight. And uh, We had a wonderful time with Brother Rich and Sister Charity Cobb and their family. They treated us good. We just appreciate them inviting the whole family and making it possible that we could all go together. This is one of the very few times in 14 years of ministry that my whole family has got to come. I think this is maybe the third time. And so it was a real blessing for all of us and we enjoyed that. And uh, I'm thankful for the brothers who ministered here. I was able to listen to the services and I enjoyed them. And uh, also that special the sisters sang on Sunday was wonderful. God bless you all. We were getting ready, we were three hours behind, so I was preparing. I was sitting at a little desk in the bedroom preparing, and Angie turned the service on, and Blake was finishing a song, and it was coming to the special, and so I quit studying, and I watched the special, and I enjoyed it, and that made us really, really homesick. So that was a bad idea. <laughs> and so then it kept playing in the background while I was studying, and then uh, Brother Ben started preaching, and he kept preaching. I kept listening. Then I got on my seat, and I'm standing there by the bed, watching the phones laying on the bed. And I said, take the phone away. And she was reaching for it. I said, wait, wait, wait a minute. And he said a few more things. I said, okay, take the phone away. And I said, well, just hold on just a second. So finally, she got the phone out of the room so I could go back to focusing on our service. But So any of you brothers that go away ministering, it's a bad idea to watch the home service makes you homesick and then you just want to see everybody but we just appreciate everybody doing their part and everybody pulling on the word and all your prayers it was a real blessing and so we're really really happy to be home again and happy to have this time together I want to remind you of the communion service after uh, this afternoon service or for this afternoon service and I'll try to remember to remind you of that again at the end of service amen let's uh, read Matthew chapter 1 verse 20. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. You can be seated. 
I wanted to start with this scripture, and the part that I really want to highlight is that all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. And so there were certain things that had to be done, and they had to be done a certain way to fulfill prophecy. And so now Joseph, uh, you know, the angel visits Mary, and we'll get into that in a minute, and gives her a commission, and she receives a conception according to the word. Joseph now is, is pondering these things, pondering about putting her away privately, and the angel comes to him in a dream and tells him what is going on and, and, and telling her not to put her away, but, but that thing which is in her is of the Holy Ghost, and, and explaining that all of this had to be done to fulfill the scriptures. And so I'd like to take a subject, the Lord is leading me down a thought of the unexpected fulfillment. And that's always been the, the trick in the fulfillment of prophecy is God always fulfills prophecy in an unexpected way. And so we have to be careful to watch for the unexpected fulfillment. I want to look at Isaiah chapter 40 as we go into this. Isaiah chapter 40 and we'll start at verse 3. I'm going to read several scriptures here back to back, and then we'll go in uh, to the thought. In Isaiah 40, verse 3, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Now just imagine that you're reading the book of Isaiah, not in 2021, but imagine you're reading the book of Isaiah in, in maybe AD 10, amen, or maybe, or, or maybe just before the birth of Christ, and you're reading the book of Isaiah, and by reading the book of Isaiah, he's giving a prophecy of the coming of the Lord, but look at, or coming of a forerunner to the coming of the Lord, but look at the prophecy. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Amen. What would you think, what would you be looking for by reading the scripture? If you didn't know the fulfillment, we're standing here and we know the fulfillment, but if you didn't know the fulfillment, when you read this portion of scripture, what would you be imagining in your mind? What would you be looking for? You would be looking for a road being built in the desert. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low. Well, that makes sense because it's got to be a straight road. So you've got to take down the mountains and you've got to fill in the valleys and make a straight path. So you would instantly be looking for a physical fulfillment of these words. And every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. When you read that scripture, not knowing the fulfillment, but just reading the scripture, you would be looking for something happening on a grand scale. You would be looking for something massive, something all flesh will see. It'll be so big, it'll be so mighty, all the mountains will be flattened, the valleys will be flat, the, the rough places smooth, it'll be made a highway in the desert for the Lord, amen, so he can come marching in triumphantly and all flesh shall see the glory of the Lord. You would be looking for something massive. Let's turn to Malachi chapter three. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Here's another one of those prophecies that you would be looking at for the fulfillment, but what would you be looking for, amen? You'd be looking for this to be fulfilled, but how would it be fulfilled? Let's turn over to Mark chapter one. Mark chapter one, 
in verse 2. As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. So that's referencing both scriptures that we just spoke about. In Isaiah 40, also uh, Malachi 3, they're both referenced here in, in verse 2 and verse 3. And it says, And the Lord make his path straight. Verse 4, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan confessing their sins. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins. And he did eat locust and wild honey and preached saying, there come one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Let's turn to Luke chapter 3 and read about John as well in here. Luke chapter 3, verse 2. Ananias and Caiaphas, Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God come unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be brought low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough way shall be made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the ax is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So now when we see, we've read the prophecy in Isaiah 40, we've read the prophecy in Malachi 3, but now we look into the New Testament to the fulfillment when this forerunner came, when this, when this messenger came uh, that, that God promised to send. When we see him emerge on the scene, he comes out of the wilderness wearing a, a, a coat of camel's hair and, and skins wrapped around his loins, eating locusts and wild honey and standing on the banks of the river and screaming for them to repent, amen? Calling them vipers and snakes and the ax is laid to the root of the tree. This is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And I wanna read a few things Brother Benham said about that. And, and God hiding himself in simplicity then revealing himself in the same. This is a message that I've been studying and this is where most of this is coming from. In fact, I'm just re-preaching Christ is a, uh, or God hiding himself in simplicity. So if you want to know what we're going to talk about, just go listen to that. Because I've been watching this and God's drawing my attention to these things and pulling some things out for me to see. And, and God hiding himself in simplicity and re then revealing himself in the same. He says, now, how all this spoke when it had been for 700 years there was to be a forerunner come before the Messiah, but when he come on the scene in such simplicity, they missed him. They were all reading the prophecies. They were looking forward to, to this coming of this forerunner that will pave the way for the coming of the Lord. Amen. And they wanted, listen, they all wanted him to come. Because they wanted to move forward in prophecy, so they wanted the messenger of the covenant to come, the forerunner to come, because they wanted the Lord to come on the scene. They wanted him to come and build that highway in the desert. They wanted him to come and bring the mountains low and bring the valleys up and the crooked places straight and the rough places smooth. They wanted him to come do that so that all could see the glory of the Lord. They wanted it, or at least they thought they wanted it. So they had an imaginary way that they thought it would come to pass and they were looking, I mean they were looking for the fulfillment to come according to their own intellectual understanding by being able to read words. 
They read words and envisioned in their mind the fulfillment of those words, amen, but when God sent the fulfillment of those same words, it didn't match the vision of their intellectual mind. It was far away from what they thought. In 1961, in the message, Sirs, we would see Jesus, said in John the Baptist, the Elijah that was coming, that he would be some great fellow because the mountains would skip like rams and the leaves would clap their hands and the high places made low and the low places high. Well, they expected some great outstanding something to shake the nation. But when he come, what was he? He was a man with a piece of sheepskin draped around him with beard all over his face, lives off of locusts and wild honey, come forth preaching on the muddy banks of Jordan and shaking the churches to repentance. They didn't want to come to repentance They just wanted the Lord to come and set up his kingdom. They just wanted all the the blessings and the good things associated with the fulfillment of prophecy. Amen. They didn't didn't realize that this calling of repentance was the preparation for the coming of the Lord. And again, in God hiding himself in simplicity, he says, what did happen? An old whiskered guy like that with no education at all with a piece of sheepskin wrapped around him comes stumbling out of the wilderness of Judea saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And you bunch of snakes, don't you think to say I belong to a certain organization? God's able to these stones to rise children to Abraham. See, Brother Brendan is now, he's coming He's coming after getting caught up into the constellation of seven angels and told to go back for the revelation of the seven seals. And so now he's come back and he's come to the first service in a series of services where he's going to be preaching on the seven seals. And this first service he comes to is God hiding himself in simplicity then revealing himself in the same. And Brother Bram starts off by doing a dedication service because they just did a, uh, a remodel to the tabernacle and expanded it. So he explains all of that. He says, now, <clears throat> he goes, I don't have time to get into those seals. I'm just going to take this little message here, but it'll tie right in. It'll tie right in. He said, now watch it. It'll tie right in. And so Brother Branham says, I'm not preaching yet on the seals. I'm just preaching this. I'm just preaching this because of the dedication. I don't have time, but it'll tie right in. So you you got to understand that the prophet, his steps were ordered to the Lord. Amen. What he preached, when he preached, the order he preached it and how he preached it, it all matters. And here he comes at the very beginning of preaching the seals. He starts with God hiding himself in simplicity, then revealing himself in the same. So we see, uh, I, I just, I like this title. I could just preach on this title because we understand that God hides himself in simplicity. Absolutely, God hides himself in simplicity, but he reveals himself in the same. So it's not just hidden in simplicity, it's revealed in simplicity. So you can say God's hidden in simplicity, but God doesn't want to stay hidden in the simplicity. He wants to be revealed through the simplicity. So the whole point is for God to bring the revelation of his word, not to keep it hidden. He hid it in simplicity so that he could reveal it through simplicity so that only the predestinated seed would catch it revealed through simplicity and everybody else would miss it. But it's not just to be hidden in simplicity. It's to be revealed in the same. Now he's, he's here preaching about John the Baptist showing up He's, he's hollering, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He says, you bunch of snakes, don't you think to say I belong to a certain organization? God's able to these stones to rise children in Abraham. They said, my, well, that's not him there. We know that's not him, but it was him. See, he was making the path clean. There's when the rough places was made plain. There's when the high places was brought down. Don't you think you got Abraham to your father? Don't begin to tell me that kind of stuff because God's able to these stones to rise children to Abraham. The high places were brought down. Oh my, that's it. Yes, see the difference? He said that's what would take place. And when they come, they thought, oh my, they were just ready to receive him if he would come to their own organization. But because he came like that in such a simple way, yet in interpreting the scriptures, the high places was made low. They didn't want to accept it, but they was. Boy, 
He shaved them off. He shook the hide right off of them. You bunch of vipers, you snakes in the grass. I tell you, the ax is laid to the root of the tree, and every tree that won't bring forth fruit is cut down and cast into the lake of fire. And I indeed will baptize you with water, but there's coming one after me who's mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire, and his fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge the floors of straw, burn up the shaft, and take the wheat to the garner. That was when the rough places was made plain, but the people didn't get it. But it's just exactly with the word, just exactly the way the word said it, so simple that they missed it, they missed seeing it. Don't you be blind, see, don't you be blind. Brother Bram tells this story about the coming of Elijah and the fulfillment of the prophecy, and when he finishes that, he's admonishing the people, said, don't you be blind. Now they were blind, they missed it, but don't you be blind. What's he preaching? God hiding himself in simplicity. What's he going into? The opening of the seals. You don't, don't you be blind, amen? This is the way God does it. And so now, when, 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 when uh, 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 John the Baptist was standing there in the spirit of Elijah, preaching such a strong message, ripping the hide off of the system, amen, and bringing them down, amen. Don't you think that, that you have Abraham, your father, God's able to these stones to raise up Abraham. He was bringing the high places low and the low places high. He was taking the crooked places and straightening them out because he says, you vipers, amen. And, and he was doing exactly what the prophecy said he would do. And for us, we have no problem saying amen to that because we can read it in the New Testament Bible. We can read G Jesus say this was Elias that was to come. But if you had been there that day, amen, and you read these scriptures and you saw that manifestation, there's only one way to take these scriptures and that manifestation and line them up together. And the only way is to have direct revelation from your father. Because God does it in such a way that he does exactly what he said he will do, but when he does exactly what he'll say he'll do, it looks so different to an understanding you get through intellectual reading of the Bible. Oprah on the same page. So all Christians have no problem saying that John the Baptist fulfilled these scriptures. But that's just because they can read where Jesus said and the Bible said that John fulfilled these scriptures. If the Bible hadn't said that and John came and went, amen, if the Bible, if you couldn't read in your New Testament that John fulfilled those scriptures and Jesus didn't say himself that he was Elias, you would be sitting here and trying to add up the prophecy in Isaiah 40 with the fulfillment in John the Baptist and he's supposed, amen, to make a highway in the wilderness, a highway in the desert for the Lord. He is supposed to take the the mountains and bring them low and make the valleys and build them up and make the crooked places straight and the rough places smooth, amen, so that all flesh will see the glory of the Lord. That's actually what's written. And he didn't come with a shovel. He didn't have a bulldozer. He didn't have a working crew. He didn't move as far as we know any dirt. But what he did is he stood out on the banks of Jordan and he says, you Pharisees, you Sadducees, you highfalutin, come down off of your high horse, amen? And you simple, you beggars and you prostitutes, hey, you're children of God too, you come on up. Come to repentance and come to the same place. You come down, you come up, amen, come to the same. What was he doing? He was making a highway in the wilderness. He was preparing the way of the Lord by knocking. What was he doing? He was spiritually fulfilling what was physically spoken by Isaiah the prophet. And something in the people moved them to his ministry. They recognized that God was there. They considered him a prophet. Even if they didn't understand the prophecies that was being fulfilled, we know that even his disciples didn't completely understand because we know John was one of his disciples. And when, 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 when the second day after Jesus was baptized, amen, when John the Baptist pointed and to, to Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, John the disciple, he left John the Baptist and he started following Jesus. So we know he was one, and we know there was two that did that, and, and, and I believe it was uh, John and Andrew. And they turned from that ministry and started following the Lamb of God. But there was a day that the disciples sat down and asked Jesus, why do the scriptures say that Elias must come first? John and Andrew were sitting there. 
They had been part of that ministry. That ministry, that ministry pointed them to the Lamb of God, and they took the word of John the Baptist as a forerunner, pointing to the Lamb of God and followed the Lamb of God, and still sat down and asked Jesus, I thought there was supposed to be more scriptures fulfilled. And he said, it, he's already come, and you didn't know it. See, it's going to take revelation from God to a select seed upon the earth because he's going to hide it in simplicity. They were looking for something huge on a huge scale. And what they got was a wild man with a fuzzy face and a, and a camel's hair coat and a leathern girdle eating locust and honey and screaming on the banks of the river and condemning them at every turn. <laughs> Can you imagine the, the, the Pharisee who studied all his life and knew the words and knew the Hebrew and, and, knew, and knew and knew and knew and, and knew so much he couldn't learn? And he knew so much he couldn't see. He saw so much he was blind and he knew so much he couldn't learn. Can you imagine him listening to John calling him, you viper? <laughs> I'm telling you, God is able these stones to rise children of Abraham. He's like, what is he talking about? Stones of children of Abraham? I'm a children, child of Abraham. I can trace my physical lineage all the way. God. I've got the documents. I've got the, I've got the certificates. I've got evidence that I'm a, I'm a child of Abraham. And he's saying, don't think to yourself, you have Abraham to your father. God's able to these stones. How is God going to take a rock and make a child of Abraham? See, the intellectual mind gets so tied up, amen, with the language of the Bible, amen, and the fulfillment of the scriptures. What he was doing when he was knocking that high priest or those priests off of their high horse, he was making the high places low. And when he was calling sinners to repentance, amen, he was bringing the low places high. He was preparing the way of the Lord, but it was not according to their understanding. And I think we all know that that's repeated in our day. The same thing has happened in the day in which we live. God has hid it in simplicity, but he's revealed it in the same. He hid it in that man, John, who didn't mess with society, didn't have any links to society, didn't, didn't have any support from the church systems. He hid it in that man. And that man was hiding the mystery. He was, he was, God was hiding himself in the simplicity of that vessel. The vessel was simple. What was hidden was God. It was the word of God coming in the manifestation, but the vessel was humble and the vessel was simple. And when they looked at the vessel and the mode in which he operated, they couldn't expect, they couldn't accept that this wonderful great thing was happening in this simple vessel because they were looking for the grand move of God, and they were missing the grand move of God. They were looking for what man calls big, and what man calls big, God calls foolish. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, <clears throat> I want to be, begin reading at verse 7. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went you out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went you out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing were in king's houses. But what went you out for to see? A prophet, yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before you. Here, Jesus is confirming that that man that you went to see is the fulfillment of that prophecy. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of a woman, there is not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. 
For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. He's telling you, if you can receive it, this was Elias. Here, Jesus is standing here himself, and Jesus himself is telling you that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 40 and Malachi 3. This is for the fulfillment of Elias. And you know, Jesus didn't have any better reputation than John the Baptist had in that day. Now, as Christians, we look back and say, that was him. Jesus said it was him. It's confirmed. John said it was him. Luke said it was him. Matthew said it was him. Jesus said it was him. Amen. But Jesus was saying, that's him. But in the day that he was saying it, his testimony wasn't any more accepted than John the Baptist's testimony was accepted. That's why he said, if you can receive it, because he knew he was speaking to a minority of the people who could actually receive what he was saying, that this was Elias that was for to come. And because this was Elias and he come, that makes me the, what he foreran, amen? He's saying, you've got to recognize what's come so you can recognize what's here. And so Jesus was standing here confirming that there was the forerunner's ministry had come because if that hadn't come, he was here to prepare the way of the Lord, amen? The messenger of the covenant. And here he was, the messenger of the covenant, amen? The Lord himself was standing here in flesh saying, if you'll receive it, that was Elias that was for to come. Okay, that was Elias. Wonderful, that was Elias. Okay, that was Elias. What's that saying about Jesus? See, if you could receive it, if you can receive that that was Elijah, if you can receive that, then what manifestation are you looking at now? If you could receive it, that was Elias. I just, I just imagine human beings are human beings are human beings, and so sometimes maybe I imagine too much, you know? What must have been in the, in the ears of those that heard that, they were like, Wow, that was Elias. Wow. That was Elias. And they're standing in front of the messenger of the covenant that he was forerunning. Amen. And I wonder how many were still missing that this was the thing that he forerun. This was the, the way that was prepared for him to come. He's the one who walked in on that path. And now he's standing here. The mighty one, the great one, is standing there saying, if you'll receive it, that was Elias. Oh, I I, I wondered, I always wondered, I thought maybe, but now he said, that's Elias. And Jesus is waiting. Oh man, can you believe it? That was what Isaiah wrote about. Ah, oh, that's what Malachi, ah, oh, that's, a, hey, Elias has come. But the whole point was the manifestation that was standing in front of them. And now they caught that Elias had come. Wonderful. But who's standing before you? You see, <clears throat> people have always been able to accept the previous dispensation. But accepting the current dispensation has always been problematic. He says, verse 15, or verse 14 again, if you, will, if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, we've said this before, but every one of them had ears that could hear physical words. But he's speaking about different ears. Because they all had ears on their head. As far as we know, there was nobody without an ear. And as far as we know, there was none among them that was deaf. Amen. So he was talking about a different set of ears. Ears that can hear what he's saying. Not the, not the vibrations that's coming off his vocal cords. Those can hit your natural ears, and then you can get a natural understanding of natural words coming from vocal cords. But he's looking for those who can hear what he's saying who can hear what he's pointing to. And the message, God hiding himself in simplicity, again, says, then, and watch what he, he done. He preached such a mighty Christ coming. 
He's got his fan in his hand. He's fanning his way. I mean, he will thoroughly pur purge his floors. He will, he will take up the trash and sweep it out yonder and burn it. That's right. <clears throat> You take out the trash, sweep it out yonder, and burn it. That's right. He will gather up the grain and take it into the garner. See, he was inspired. But when Jesus come, they was looking for, and all them apostles, you know, they was looking for a great something to come. My, my, boy, he's coming. That's all there is to it. Boy, he will be mighty. He will kick them Romans off the face of the earth. My, he will make them Greeks go this way and Romans go that way when he come. When he come, a little humble fellow being pushed around from one side to the other, what was it? God hiding himself in simplicity. Even John the Baptist in his ministry, those that would accept him now as the forerunner, the prophet that would come, he's now preaching of Jesus. He says, there's one that coming after me whose shoe lashes I'm not worthy to unloose, and his fan is in his hand, and he'll thoroughly purge his threshing floor. And they're like, yeah! Yeah, he's going to sweep the Romans right out of here. He's going to move the Greeks. He's going to be a mighty conqueror. Yes, yes, yes. And because they were looking for a mighty warrior with a fan in the hand that would thoroughly purge his threshing floor, they missed the little stoop shoulder. Man, prophet who came walking along and healing the sick and doing miracles and they missed that this was what John was speaking about because when John spoke about that, they envisioned something in their mind by intellect and when he stood there before them, amen, they didn't correlate this is that. When he come, he's a little humble fella being pushed around from one side to the other. They wanted a general. They didn't want this little man who would hide himself and move through the crowd and, and leave. They didn't want this man who was being rejected and scorned and ridiculed and he would just go from place to place or leave Jerusalem because they wanted to stone him and go back into Galilee. They didn't want that kind. They were looking for the mighty one with his fan in his hand that would thoroughly purge his threshing floor. They wanted their understanding of what that was. He says, it's got to come in their own way for their own denomination, and except it does that, it isn't him. It's just psychology, or it's the devil, or it's not God, because if it was God, he'd have to come in their own way, you see, the way we've got it interpreted. That's the way that Jesus had to come to the Pharisees. It had to be that way. See, if God was going to send the Messiah, they had it all interpreted just how he must be, and because he come different, than it, then he wasn't the Messiah. He was the illegitimate something. He was the Beelzebub, but it was God hiding in simplicity. So you see what the denominations do, and then I'd like to say it this way. You see what the denominational spirit does. Because if we say denominations, you'll miss it because it comes so much closer to home than that. We've been separated from the denominations now since the ministry of Brother Bantam, but don't forget there's a denominational spirit that's still moving that's still trying to infiltrate, to penetrate, to have influence because that's the spirit that he's always, the Antichrist has always used to derail the plan of God and to trick, to trap the people of God. So he's not moving to new tactics. He's still using that old denominational spirit. And the denominational spirit had an intellectual interpretation of the fulfillment of the scriptures so that when Jesus came, now because he came different than their understanding, they couldn't just leave him alone and let him preach. Because he came different, now he couldn't be the Messiah. And if he's not the Messiah, then he must be Beelzebub. So that's why it's an antichrist spirit, because an antichrist spirit is not a spirit that just says, I don't understand that, it doesn't make sense to me. An antichrist spirit says, that's not him. That's not God, that's not Christ, that's not the fulfillment of the word, that's not the truth, that's not right. That's an antichrist spirit, amen? And so it, the Antichrist spirit is not somebody who is just confused on the matter and somebody says, I don't understand, it doesn't make sense to me, I don't know. The denominational Antichrist spirit couldn't just say, I don't know, he's doing a good work, I don't understand, maybe it's gone, maybe it's not, I'm not sure, yet let's just wait and see. No, the Antichrist spirit said, no, look in the scriptures. Does it say anything about a prophet out of Nazareth? He's not it. 
Look at the scriptures. Where was the forerunner that made the highway in the wilderness? That hasn't come yet, so this isn't him. When he comes, he, he's going to thoroughly purge the threshing floor. He's going to do this and do that. And so they take, they, they take their own interpretation of the words that they have read in the book, and they try to match the manifestation to their own interpretation. And when the manifestation doesn't match the interpretation, they reject the manifestation and call it Beelzebub. They call it an evil spirit. They call it heresy. They call it a cult. They call it all kinds of things. And that denominational spirit is an antichrist spirit that will fight the very fulfillment of the word instead of just leaving it alone. Gamaliel showed a great example. He said, just leave it alone. If it's, a, if it's not of God, it'll come to not. Amen. But don't go out there and blast what you don't understand. And so now... Now, the, the, because it didn't come according to their denominational understanding, now they see a manifestation, but the manifestation doesn't match their understanding, so they attribute the manifestation to the devil instead of recognizing this is the Lord, this is the messenger of the covenant. That was Elias that was to come, and this is him. Let's go to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Here's another prophecy laying of a forerunning of Elijah. And we know that this is a, a split prophecy in verse 6 because we know that John the Baptist uh, foreran his first coming and John the Baptist did the first part of this all the way to the comma he turned the heart of the fathers to the children because they were coming to a new and living way the fulfillment of the law and Christ was going to become the propitiation for their sins and they were being brought into a new and living way to enter into the holy of holies and so now he fulfilled that the turning the hearts of the fathers to the children but there's another part of the prophecy and the heart of the children to their fathers. So now the children that now are going to grow up, this New Testament children, there's going to come a time that the heart of these same children are going to be turned back to the original fathers, to the original Pentecostal fathers. And so when you read this prophecy, he says now, uh, Verse 5, behold, I will send you Elijah to the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So Christians know that this is a prophecy that must be fulfilled. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. We read this scripture, and for us, by revelation, it is so easy to understand. We can see the fulfillment of this. But just imagine reading this scripture, amen, for, for uh, 2,000 years before the coming of the prophet in this end time to fulfill this, amen. And you have to come up with all kinds of ideas of what it means to turn the hearts of the fathers and the fathers and the children. I mean, there's, there's whole ministries in, in Christendom out there. The, there's whole ministries that are called the Elijah ministries that are trying to restore natural fathers and natural sons. They're having camps and crusades and, and teaching fathers how to be good dads and, and bring the relationship between a natural father and natural son, and they believe that they're fulfilling this prophecy. See what the carnal mind does? And when you see the prophecy fulfilled, what is the fulfillment of the prophecy? It comes in such a simple vessel. Amen. It comes in, in a man, amen, born in poverty in Kentucky. Amen. A small man of stature without much education, had a seventh grade education, with no political backing, with no, with no uh, uh, institutional backing, with no formal education. God took such a simple vessel to fulfill this prophecy. And we... We, you know, we, we who have, have eyes to see and ears to hear, we look at the fulfillment and say, absolutely, that's the fulfillment. But listen, we see it so plain because we have eyes to see and ears to hear. 
It's been revealed to us of the Father. So for us, it's not a stumbling block. We can look at that and say, that's absolutely the truth. And, and we've seen the manifestation of that. But the manifestation came so simple. It came so humble that millions and billions have had a hard time accepting that this is the fulfillment of that scripture. He come in such a simple vessel, but re realize that that scripture was hidden in simplicity, amen, <clears throat> of a man that, that when he started in the ministry couldn't read his own scriptures, he would have his girlfriend stand up in church and read the scriptures. Now, listen, if you're, if you're one of the big highfalutin denomination scholars, I mean, that's a hard pill to swallow, that God is going to forerun the second coming. I mean, he's going to send Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord to turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers. And this man, this man that he's going to use, he can't read his own Bible in front of people. He'll hand it to his, his girlfriend and ask his girlfriend to read the scriptures and then he'll preach. Oh, that's a, that's a hard one to accept, friends. Unless... Unless you have eyes to see and ears to hear. And you can say, that's perfect. That's the way he's always worked. That's the way the Bible's written. That's the pattern God has always used. But you can see how millions would miss the manifestation of the hour because they missed the way it came. It's not that God wasn't faithful to send it. It wasn't that God didn't do exactly what he said he would do. He, he sent it the way he said he would send it. He sent it when he said he would send it. He did exactly what he said he would do. But there was such an intellectual understanding of the scripture, amen, that when it came, it couldn't be him. So they would have to say, he does those things by the devil. It's mental telepathy. It's familiar spirits. It's all of these things. Why? Because the denominational spirit, amen, can't accept it because of intellectual understanding. And when they can't accept it, when the fulfillment doesn't match their interpretation, then they reject the fulfillment. Praise God. In the message of the trial, we're not preaching anything new, so don't wait for the new thing. We've heard all of this before, but it, it just becomes more real to us all the time, amen? It becomes more tangible, it becomes more vivid, amen? Week by week, month by month. And the trial says, he spoke down on the river, he said, as John the Baptist was sent forth to proclaim the coming of Christ. Oh. Oh, praise God. I'm gonna read the rest of this sentence. This is, this is the, that pillar of fire that came down in 1933 when Brother Branham was baptizing the 17th person and that pillar of fire spoke. Listen to how Brother Branham repeats it this time. Listen to what he says. He says, he spoke down on the river. He said, as John the Baptist was sent forth to proclaim the coming of Christ, at the end of his ministry, Jesus came. As John was sent, so will your ministry forerun the second coming of Christ. What did he just say, amen? But let's not gloss over these things. What did he just say? He said, as, he's making a type. He's running a parallel picture. As John the Baptist was sent forth to proclaim the coming of Christ, at the end of his ministry, Jesus came. And as John was sent, so will your ministry forerun the second coming of Christ. So if they're a parallel, if they're running on parallel tracks, amen, then as John the Baptist foreran the first coming of Christ, so will your ministry forerun the second coming. But how did it work the first time? Amen, at the end of his ministry, Jesus came. So what will you expect the second time? At the end of his ministry, Jesus will come. Brother Branham's drawing a parallel. He's typing the two as, amen. But the coming of the Lord is such a mystery to the minds of people because they take Catholic dogma and they reheat it through the Lutherans, through the Methodists, through the Pentecostals until they've got a vision and an image of the coming of the Lord that is not scriptural. And because of that, because of that intellectual understanding of reading the Bible and coming up with their own interpretation, now when he comes and fulfills the promise in our day, the interpretation doesn't match the fulfillment. So what do they do to the fulfillment? Amen, they call it horrible names. They say it's a false teaching and it's heresy and it's antichrist and it's a cult. And
But as John the Baptist foreran his first coming, so will your ministry forerun a second. As John, at the end of his ministry, Jesus came. Well, what happens at the end of Brother Branham's ministry? Maybe the same thing. Maybe it's the same way. Maybe what, that, maybe what God was speaking on that pillar of fire was the truth. Maybe we missed it because we had our own doctrine, our own denominational understanding. We already had a picture in our mind. And listen, I don't fault anybody for having a picture in my mind. I've had it all my life. All my life I was taught a certain way. I read the Bible with a certain intellectual understanding. I have my own pictures. And you know what I'm finding out? Sometimes I still have my own pictures that God is correcting from the message and from the Bible. That God is still breaking down some of the wrong images that I have, the wrong pictures I have in my mind because I'm taking it by intellectual reading. Amen. And, and if we've learned anything this morning, I hope we learned that you cannot see the fulfillment by an intellectual reading of the promise. Because there is no way that you could read the intellectual promise of a forerunner and look at John the Baptist and say, he fulfilled that. How would you ever come up with that intellectually? It doesn't match intellectually, but by revelation spiritually, it just goes like this. So if we've learned anything this morning, that's what I want us to learn, is you can't just take Bible school intellectual reading of a Bible and then as the promise that will come and then come to the promise and say, I, I understand it by the intellectual reading. You'll only understand it by seeing the fulfillment. And when you see the fulfillment, that's the interpretation of the word. And then God will quicken to your heart. That's it. That's the only way you'll see it, friends. Amen. You remember, they never saw it till it was fulfilled. Who knew what it was going to look like? Who knew how he was going to fulfill it? I mean, who knew what, what it was going to be until he does it? Amen. And when he does it, when he does it, he interprets the word by bringing it to pass. And when he interprets the word by bringing it to pass, then the Father must quicken a revelation to you that this is that. Amen. Back to God hiding himself in simplicity. He said, you love him? My, isn't he wonderful? I hope and trust that the message will produce what it was intended to do. What's he talking about? This message, God hiding himself in simplicity and revealing himself this, in the same. He's now coming to the end of this message. He said, I, I hope and trust that the message will produce what it was intended to do, that it'll get you to a place that you don't look for flowery things. Or some, when you see God in greatness, look how humble it is, and then you'll see God. Don't look for him. When Elisha was back in the cave, the smoke went across blood, thunder, lightning, and all these kinds of sensations. We've had blood in the face and in the hands and sensations and everything. They never bothered that prophet. He just laid there, but he heard a still small voice. What was it? The word. Lock that in. What was it Elijah heard that moved him out of the cave that got him into action? He heard the word. What was the still small voice? The word, amen. There was a whirlwind, amen. There was a fire, there was a thunder. None of it moved him, amen. But when he heard the still small voice, that was the word. And when he heard the word, he moved. But how did he move? When he heard the word, he took his mantle and wrapped his face in humility, amen. And he come out to face God because he was called by the word out of the cave. And how is God going to call you and I by the whirlwind, by the fire, by the, by the, by the earthquake? Or he's going to call you by the still small voice of his word? And how we'll know he called you is because you will wrap a mantle around your face and walk out of that cave with humility. Not pride, not arrogance, but humility because you'll recognize this small voice, this still small voice. That is the word. That is God. He heard a still small voice, what was it? The word. Then he covered his face and walked out. See, that was it. Remember, friend, don't look for great big. You say, God, he speaks of great big things. 
There'll come a time there'll be this, that, or the other, great big things. I hope you're catching what I'm talking about, see? Great big things, and oh, when this comes to pass, it'll be great, big like this, and it'll be so humble, you'll miss the whole thing and just go right on. You'll look back and say, well, that never did come, see, passed right over the top, and you never even seen it. See, it's so, it's so simple. God lives in simplicity to manifest himself in greatness. What makes him great? Because he can simplify himself. Brother Branham now is coming to the end of God hiding himself in simplicity, and he's saying, I hope this message has a, the, he says, I hope it has the effect. It'll produce what was in, it, it was intended to do. So Brother Branham said, I'm not preaching on the seals yet here, but it'll tie right into it. Just catch, he said, just catch what I'm saying. And at the end he says, I hope this message will produce what it was intended to produce, that you don't look for big flowery things, that you're not looking for great big things, that if we're looking for the fulfillment of the promise, what promise? The promise that was foran. Because we're looking at Brother Branham's ministry, and how many believe he was the forerunner? He's the fulfillment of Malachi 4. He's the Elijah that is to come. Amen, he's come. He's in his ministry. He's forerunning something. Amen, and the thing that he's forerunning needs to come. <clears throat> because like it was for John, amen, that Jesus came while John was still on earth. And he's running a parallel. That's why Brother Brandon, when he gets to the Revelations 10, he starts talking about this mighty angel with a rainbow overhead with an open book. Amen. He says, it's none other but the angel of the covenant. It's none other but Christ. And when he looks at that, he says, now this coming, this seventh angel, which is the same as Malachi 4, Elijah, this seventh angel will be on earth at the time of this coming, which parallels John the Baptist, the first coming. And so now Brother Benham's coming to God, hiding himself in simplicity, and here he is, the forerunner, amen, forerunning the second coming. His ministry is forerunning the second coming, and he's coming to preach the seals, and he's saying, now listen, don't look for something big. What's he coming to do? Preach the seals, amen. What's he coming to do? Preach, amen, what was in those seven unknown thunders. The unwritten word that was in the pyramid, the rock under the rock. And he's coming to that and he's saying, now don't look for something big. When God comes, it'll be so humble that they'll miss it and go right over it. That was his intended purpose of preaching God hiding himself in simplicity. Brother Branham says he doesn't yet, he doesn't yet know what those seals are. And he told us day by day, one of those angels would come to him and give him the revelation, amen, and he would see it, he would see what it was doing, and he would write it down. Then after he wrote it down, he would search the scriptures to find it all through the scriptures. Then he would come preach it that night. Then it would happen the next day and the next day and the next day. So Brother Branham here preaching God, hiding himself in simplicity, does not know what he's going to be preaching Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. He doesn't know what he's preaching, but he knows the principle of God. Don't look for something big, amen. If you're going to see the fulfillment of the scripture, if this ministry is forerunning something, the something that is forerun is going to have to come while this seventh angel is on the earth. And he says, don't look for something big. Don't look for something great. Amen. Look at Elijah in the cave. The earth shook under the whirlwind. The rocks crashed. The earthquake shook everything around him. The fire burned everything off the mountain. But none of that moved him. That wasn't it yet. But when he heard the still small voice, that was the word. And it was the smallest thing, the quietest of the four events. You had the the wind, the whirlwind, the fire, the earthquake, and the voice. The quietest of the four events moved the prophet. The the most subtle of the four events moved the prophet. The, The least intense, I'm speaking just carnally now, not spiritually. 
the least intense, the least fearful, the least physically discerned. That's what moved that prophet. And what was it? It was the word. Because the fourth, the fourth act, the fourth dispensation was greater than the three. Greater than the fire, greater than the earthquake, greater than, than the whirlwind, greater than all of that was the word. Because the word is greatest of all. See, Brother Benham comes now and he preaches the seals. And we know how he preaches through that week. And he says, it's been a supernatural week. He said, you know, he said, I'm, I'm nearly, he comes to the end of it, he said, I'm nearly out of my mind. A man, a man can only take so much. He said, all of this has been happening, coming to me day by day. And, and it gets to the end and he comes to the seventh seal and he's preaching in the seventh seal and he comes d- down uh, towards the end of the seventh seal and he said, I better stop right there. I just feel checked not to say no more about it. So just remember the seventh seal, the reason it was not open, the reason it did not reveal it, no one should know about it. And I want you to know before I even know one word about that, the vision came years ago. You remember that. He said, I feel checked to say no more about it. And he talks about uh, no one should know about it. And I want you to know before I even know one word about that, the vision came years ago. And he's talking about something he mentioned previously. He said the vision came years ago. What vision? He's talking about the third pool vision that he had back in 1956. And the third pool vision he had in 1956 is where he was fishing, amen? And all the ministers were gathering around. He was trying to catch the rainbow trout in the deep water. So the rainbow trout were covenant fish, the rainbow covenant fish in the deep water. And he had this fishing lure, and he kind of knew the techniques of fishing, and the ministers were gathering around and wanting to learn how to do it. And he gave it a little pull, and he said that attracted the little fish, amen. And then he gave it another jerk, which was supposed to scatter the fish and attract the big fish. But he pulled too hard on the second pull. And when he did, he said, it come out a little fish just like skin over the lure. He said, I caught a little one like them other brothers were catching. So that second pool caught the same kind of fish all the other ministers were catching. And what was the second pool? It was discernment. When he would tell you your name and what was wrong with you and and where you lived and what had happened in your past, all of that, he he said uh, that when I pulled that too hard, I come out and caught a little bit of fish just like those other brothers were catching. but he was trying to catch the rainbow trout. So when he pulled too hard, he got the line tangled around him, amen, and he was upset, and the angel told him, don't get your line tangled in a time like this. Then he saw that he had a baby shoe, and he was trying to take a giant cord and push it through the eyelid of a baby shoe, and the voice said, you can't teach Pentecostal babies supernatural things. Leave them alone. So whatever this is coming after the second pull, the Pentecostal babes can't catch it. It's got to go beyond Pentecostal. Now, Brother Bram's not talking about original Pentecostal faith. He's talking about the Pentecostal denomination, the Pentecostal movement. What I call Pentecostalism. Couldn't catch it. Couldn't get it. They couldn't catch the supernatural things. Leave them alone. So then the next thing he's caught up and a vision, and he sees a giant cathedral, amen, and, and he's up in the air, and there's a cathedral, and there's people outside moving their way through to the prayer line, and there's a little room, and he's told, I'll meet you in there, and he said, this will be your third pool. So the first pool, you know, attracted the fish, the second pool caught the little fish like everybody else was catching, but he was trying to catch the rainbow trout, but he said, coming to the third pool, that third pool Amen, that, that's the pool that was supposed to catch the rainbow trout, the covenant fish, the elect seed of God. What was it? The third pool is the word. Because he goes up to Sabino Canyon in January of 1963, and in Sabino Canyon, he's up there praying, Lord, what is this all about? His hands are in the air, and something struck his hand, and he looked, it was a sword, and a voice said, it's the sword of the king. 
And Brother Bram said, he eventually come to the conclusion that, that a king, the king, the king, not a king, the king, he only has one sword and that sword is his word. And Brother Bram said, so help me, it's the word, amen? It's the word. That's the third pull. What's the third pull? It's the same thing that pulled Elijah out of the cave. It's the word. And it wasn't the great big fiery things. It wasn't the great big showy things. Amen. The first pool was to attract the little fish. The second pool was intended, to, it was intended to scatter the fish to get the attention of the big fish. And the third pool was the one that was supposed to hook the covenant fish. And what is the third pool? The third pool is the word. And so, what is the word? The third pull is the word. What is the word? Well, it's more doctrinal teaching, a better understanding. The word is Christ. The word is a person. It's Jesus Christ. In the beginning, the word was with God. The word was God. We know the word was eventually made flesh and dwelt among us. The word is the person of the word, Jesus Christ himself. Amen. What is the third pull? It's the word. I mean, you, we say that, it's the word, it's the word. And I think sometimes referring back to intellectualism, not, not anything that, that, that we mean to do, but going to intellectualism, we say the word like, like we'll, we'll hold up a Bible or something and look at a page with black marks on it. And there's nothing wrong with that because this is the materialized form of that word. But the word is a person, amen. The word is the person of the word, the anointed word, Jesus Christ himself. What was Brother Branham doing that week? Amen, that he was preaching the seals. Amen, he was preaching the mystery that laid under those seven thunders. Amen, when seven thunders uttered, John was about to write, but he was told, don't write those things. So there was something that thundered, and he said, thundered is a voice of God. Something thundered that was not permitted to be written. And Brother Branham said, when the seventh seal opened, nothing was written, John didn't write anything. He said, see, they're connected together. These two things are connected together. What? The seventh seal and the sealing up of the thunder. So what the thunder spoke and the, that, that became silent and not writing it and the silence under the seventh seal, those two things are connected together. So what was under those seven thunders? The unwritten word. Light had never shined upon this before. Now the prophet of God is coming day by day, not of his own accord, not of his own ability, but one of those messenger angels came every day and gave him the revelation and he saw it and he saw what it did and he wrote it out and then he went through the scriptures to search it out, amen, and then he would bring it that night, then he would do it the next day, then he would do it the next day. What was he doing? Amen. He was preaching the revelation of the seven seals, amen. That means the seven seals were breaking open in the sounding of the thunders. They were open 2,000 years ago in symbol form, but the interpretation of the symbols was the breaking forth of the sealed thunders. And the only one that can break those seals is the Lamb. That's why Brother Branham, when he's in the seals, he says, he, he, he says, oh, I don't know which, which sermon it's in, either God hiding himself in simplicity or the breach. He says, now if you'll watch, you'll see something happening this week. Remember those angels. He said, I hope I don't have to take it right out in my hand and show it to you. Remember he said that. I hope I don't have to take it right out. And then later he says, I hope you've seen the mysterious part of the week. What is it? It's those seven angels. Well, of course, the seven angels are a mystery. I mean, they made up the head of Christ. They're angels. We can't see them. Of course, they're a mystery. What were the angels doing? They were coming to him day by day to give him the revelation of the broken seal, showing that the lamb is the only one that can break the seal. So who's the one breaking the seals? Who was it in March of 1963 that was breaking the seals and revealing to the prophet? It was the lamb. He's the only one who could do it. Brother Bram said, it's not me. Don't put any man in this at all. Don't look to me. Don't even say thank you. It wasn't me at all. That wasn't my thinking. It was them angels. What was it? The lamb was on the scene. And... He come in such simplicity. It was a simple vessel with a seventh grade education 
with no seminary training, with no big backing. And he was preaching in a little brick building in Jeffersonville, Indiana, on the corner of 8th and Penn Street. Have anybody been by the building? Don't look for great big things. Don't look for flowery things. In that building, day after day, day after day, the lamb was breaking the seals. Brother Ben's saying, can you see what's going on? Do you see what's going on? It's all around you and you've missed it. Around me. See, intellectualism will never catch it. It's all around me. What's around me? Something's here. How do I? It was happening all around them. What? The preaching of the seals. It was happening all around them that week, and they were missing the significance of what was taking place. They were reveling in the revelation underneath those symbols that, wow, that ties together, and that ties together, and that ties together, and that ties Wow, it all ties together. Yes, it all ties together. That's what the seal means. That's what the thunders uttered. Oh, I see it now. Do you see it now? Do you see? Do you see it now? Well, now, yeah, I see. I see a white horse and it's Antichrist coming forth. And I, and I see a, a red horse. Now he's fighting a black horse. I see it. I see what was in those seven thunders. Do you really see it? Because who's the one breaking the seals? That's the mysterious part of the week. That's what was coming in such simplicity. They were missing the mighty angel had come down with an open book in his hand and the seventh angel was on earth at the time of this coming and now he was proving it by the preaching of the seals. And the preaching of the seals was proving that the mighty angel has come down with an open book in his hand. And Brother Bram said it's been going on all around you all this week. Have you caught the mysterious part of them week, Charlie? Remember that vision? Remember it's them, been them angels. What? Them angels of the mysterious. What? The constellation? What? Turn it to the right. Who is it? See, the mysterious part of the week was the one who was able to break the seals. How many people left? saying, I never knew a white horse rider was an antichrist. I always thought that was Christ. And they weren't wrong, and it wasn't wrong for them to marvel in that revelation. That was right. And how many people were saying, but did you ever notice the red horse when they went out, and you notice it matches the church ages just perfectly? But Brother Brenham said there's a mystery that lays under those thunders. What is the mystery that lays under the thunders? The mystery that lays over the thunders is the one who broke the seals. That's the mystery laying under those seven thunders. He goes, now he's in the seventh seal. He's preached all of this, and it's just amazing to me. He's preached all of this, and now he comes to the seventh seal. And the seventh seal, he is actually not saying anything like he did the first seal. He's saying a lot. Go back and read the seventh seal again. Brother Branham is telling you what the seal is in the seventh seal. He is absolutely, the first time I read the seventh seal, I read it with anticipation. I read it with bated breath. I'd gone through six seals and I understood what he was talking about. I saw it tied together. I saw it run down through the scripture and then I knew, I knew he had went down through, I think it was Matthew 24 and showed that when Jesus went through the six seals, he left off the seven. In Revelation chapter eight, he left off the seven. Amen, in Revelation chapter 10, the seven thunders were sealed up and I'm like, oh, here it comes. And I'm reading, and I'm reading, and I'm reading. And I remember reading, like I had so caught what Brother Bannon was showing and how the seals were open and how he showed the interpretation uh, of those seven seals and how he tied it all the way down to the scripture and how he showed that nothing yet has been written about this seventh. And, and I, I so saw that that I get to the seventh, I'm like, it's coming, it's coming. Amen, the thing that wasn't written, he's gonna tell us all about it. And I remember my heart beating faster as I got further back in the book. And he said, now I feel to stop right there. It was the letdown of my life. I remember being so disappointed and so discouraged 
And then after that, he just goes back and tells all the stories again. Do you remember uh, what I told you in the vision? What time is it, sirs? Yeah, I heard that. I want to know what the seventh seal is. Do you remember that constellation of angels and I went out west and come back for the interpretation? Do you remember that? Do you remember the, the vision I had and I had the baby shoe in my hand? And remember, and he said, I'll meet you in there. And, and he said, you remember that would be your third pool then on Sabina Canyon that day and that happened? He said, this is your third pool. So Brother Bram's saying, he said, that, was, that will be your third pool, foreshadowing it seven years before. Now seven years later, he's saying, this is your third pool. And Brother Bram said, did you see that? And did you see this? And did you see that? I don't feel to say anymore. I'm like, okay. I mean, you didn't say anything anyways. <laughs> but I've just went back and read the seventh seal about three times in a row in the last couple of weeks. And he absolutely tells you what it is. Amen. Amen. This opening of the seventh seal is declaring that the mighty angel has come down. And the evidence that he's come down is the opening of the seals, which is the preaching of the thunders, proving who's here to open the seals. That's the mystery that's laying under those mysterious thunders. He's telling you right in the seventh seal, he's telling you that this is the third pull. This is what will attract the rainbow trout. This is the word, amen. This was the unwritten word laying under that capstone. Lights never shined on this before. It wasn't written in the Bible that this is the interpretation, but he's come down and took the very Bible to show you what the unwritten word is. And this was the opening of the seventh seal, and Brother Benham was standing there showing you that the seventh seal was now open. But remember when he got to the vision of the third pool, and the vision of the third pool said, this will be your third pool, and you won't tell it to nobody. And Brother Benham said, when that seventh seal opens, it'll be a total secret. Brother Benham said, oh, go back and read the seventh seal. Brother Bram said, he's, he's in the seventh seal, I think it's the seventh seal. He says, now it's been going on all around you and I was forbidden to tell you until the services were over. I'm like, Praise God, services are over, tell me. That's what he's doing in the seventh seal, he's telling you. But he can't come right out and tell you. He said, you won't explain this one. He's not allowed to explain this one. All he can do is demonstrate it. All he can do is show it, amen? All he can do is rehearse the visions and, and tell you what's happened that week. And it's been those angels. And those angels came to me every day. And I didn't know those things. It's not a man. It's not me. This is the mysterious part of the week. It's been going on all around you. He can't tell you what it is, but he can tell you what's happened. Because if you can see what's happened, then you know what it is. And he comes here to the seventh seal. And he says, now, I better stop there. I'm going to read this sentence again. I feel checked not to say no more. So just remember the seventh seal, the reason it was not open, the reason it did not reveal it, no one should know about it. And I want you to know before I even know one word about that, that the vision come years ago, you remember that. And here it is, just as these others has slides right straight into the word exactly where it was. And God knows my heart, I never one time thought of such a thing as that. And there it was, it's later than we think. So those visions was the vision of the third pool. You won't tell it to nobody, it'll be a secret. That slides right into this, he said. Oh my, just shows it's from God. If it's exactly in the promises of God from the end of the message. You notice, notice now, for the end of time message, this seal. He's revealed, what is this seal? The end of time message. Have we heard the end of time message? That's what this seal is. For the end of time message, this seal. He's revealed all the six seals, but he don't say nothing about the seventh. And the end time seal when it starts will be absolutely, totally secret according to the Bible. Before knowing that, and remember, Revelations 10, 1 to 7, chapter 10, 1 to 7, at the end of the seventh angel's message, all the mysteries of God should be known. We are at the end time, the opening of the seventh seal. Did I miss something? Or did he tell you we're here? We're at the end time, the opening of the seventh seal. This seal is the end of time message. Now listen to what he says now. 
Now, how did I know the other day, last Sunday, a week ago today, when I was preaching on be humble, be humble. Remember, God deals in little things. I didn't realize what I was really talking about, and now I see it. It's in such a humble way. You think that something like that would be revealed to the Vatican, or but to come just like John the Baptist, it comes like the birth of our Lord in a stable. Glory to God, so help me the hours at hand. We're here. What's he doing? He's saying, I didn't even know. Like I knew I was supposed to preach that. I knew it had tied into the, the message, but I didn't know coming here to the seventh seal. I didn't know standing here that, I, that a week ago, this Sunday, a week ago, that I would be saying, be humble, be humble, be humble. You would think something like this. What's he talking about? It would be so grand that something like this, it would be revealed at the Vatican. Or it comes in such a, uh, or, but it comes like John the Baptist. It comes like the birth of our Lord in the stable. What's he talking about? He's talking about the seventh seal. What's the seventh seal? The coming of the Lord. He said you would think something like that would, would be preached in the Vatican. But no, it's at this little brick church on the corner of 8th and Penn Street. It's not preached by the Pope. What is it? The greatest message is striking earth for the day. And it's not preached in the big churches and the big halls. It's a little brick building. He said it comes like John the Baptist. What was John the Baptist? He didn't follow in his father's footsteps as a priest. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't have backing. He was a wild man out in the wilderness eating honey and when wild locusts and coming out with camel skin over it saying repent, amen, repent. And, and you high places be brought down, you low places be brought up. What's coming? The opening of the seventh seal is just like that. There's two things he talks about that this seal is like. It's like the coming of John the Baptist and the coming of our Lord in the stable. What's happening? Maybe it's the second forerunner and the thing that he forerun. Maybe it come just like the first time. Maybe it come like John the Baptist and our Lord in the stable. How many people were driving by that day and knew there was a church service and had no clue what was going on? How many people on earth had no clue what was going on? Jesus was, uh, his mother was coming down, amen, from, from Nazareth, coming out of Galilee into and to Bethlehem, how many people knew it? She was carrying the word. The Messiah was within her. How many people knew it? It would come such a simple, humble way. It come from a girl out of Nazareth, a mean city. It didn't come like they would expect this to come. A virgin shall conceive. Well, what is our conception of a virgin? It's the virgin nation because the glorious nation of Israel. Or it must be the virgin daughter of the high priest. It's always got to be something big. But when the angel came, he came to a little virgin that was chosen before the foundation of the world. Amen. That was going to get water. Amen. A little virgin girl in Nazareth that nobody knew about and very few people cared anything about. But the time of the promise was going to be fulfilled in her, and now she was going to be carrying the word. Now the word was going to be in her. And here she comes walking around pregnant, amen, and, and she is the fulfillment of the prophecy, but because they didn't expect the prophecy to be fulfilled that day, their interpretation and the fulfillment didn't match, so they reject the interpretation and start rumors and lies about how she was impregnated. She's, what are they claiming? Listen, what are the lies telling you? The lies are telling you that that's some man's seed in her. But that was no man's seed in her. That was the, the seed, Christ, amen, that was within her. And Brother Benham comes to the seventh seal, and he says, ah, you think something like that would be preached in the Vatican, but it comes like John the Baptist. It comes like our Lord in a stable. I'm telling you, the same thing has happened and they've missed it. God help us not to keep missing it. Open our eyes, Lord, and let us see what's happening all around us, amen. 
Let us recognize our day and its message. Let us recognize what you're doing in this hour and let us, God, wash away denominational understanding out of our mind. Wash away intellectual reading out of our mind and give us your revelation on the word, eyes to see and ears to hear because we must have it in this hour. It comes like John the Baptist, like the birth of our Lord in the stable. Glory to God, so help me. The hour is at hand. We're here. Now do you see it? <laughs> what a question. How many do you think in the group he was talking about saw it? Now do you see it? The truth of God's vision. The seven angels bringing me from the west. They were coming from the west, coming back east, bringing here for this message tonight. See, don't go intellectual on me. He says, those seven angels picked me up and brought me back to the east, brought me here for this message tonight. Say, but I thought it was the angels each night. You missed it. Each night was pointing to the seventh seal. Every day, the revelation coming forth on the seal was pointing. He says, those angels brought me back for this message tonight. This was the whole purpose, the opening of the seventh seal. It was the point of those angels' visitation. It was the reason I was caught up, and they brought me back here for this message tonight. All those six are pointing to this. The revelation under each one of them is pointing to this. They brought me here for this message tonight. Now the voice of that great thunder and the mission that was brought here has been revealed. It's proven that it was of God. Just think now, I knew not these seals. And they've been revealed this week. Did anybody think of that? Oh, those seven angels being this, being the message that was coming forth. Them angels bring me back here for that. I say, thank you, Lord. God, give me eyes to see and ears to hear all that you're doing in this day. Let's just stand. I feel to stop right there. I got much more, but we'll come back Wednesday for that. I want to stop right there. Remember, like I said, if you take anything away today, if you hear anything, remember that an intellectual reading of the Scripture can never prepare you for the interpretation or the fulfillment of that Scripture. God hiding himself in simplicity and revealing himself in the same. God was hiding himself in the simplicity of that little preacher in that little building and that eight day meeting. Amen. It was simple. Amen. It was as simple as simple could be. It was a little brick building in a little Midwest town with a, a, a small of stature preacher that had no great tie-ins with any denomination or, or was not orchestrated with many other people. And in that man with limited education and ability, he was in that little brick building with a bunch of regular people. A bunch of average, slightly above, slightly below, it all averages out. A bunch of average people. And they were all sitting there. What was happening? Amen. A tremendous event was happening. Amen. It was God hiding himself in simplicity, but revealing himself in the same. It wasn't just the hiding. Amen. It was hiding if you don't have ears to, eyes to see and ears to hear. But it was also the revealing if you have eyes to see and ears to hear. How will I see it? I'll see it in the same thing he hid it in is the same thing he'll reveal it in. It's the same mechanism. Amen, it was John the Baptist that he hid that forerunner coming in, but it was John the Baptist that he revealed the forerunner coming in. It was in the stature of a man, amen, that, 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 that God hid the coming of Messiah. It was in the stature of a human being that was born of a baby, that was born in a stable, amen, that had a, his mother had a bad reputation and a rumor about his birth, amen, and, 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 and he had nothing going for him in life. He was simple. Listen, we think of Jesus Christ and we love him and adore him, amen, because of what he's done for us. But if you look back in that day, he would have been a regular person walking down a regular road dressed in regular garb. The scripture says there was no, no beauty that we should behold him. There was nothing to attract your attention to him physically. But it was the still small voice that attracted the attention. How 
How many people walked past Jesus in his lifetime? Rubbed shoulders with him, walked through the market with him, and had no idea who he was. God was hiding. God was hiding the coming of the Messiah in that vessel. Simple. But he was revealing the coming of the Messiah in that vessel. Simple. God hidden and revealed in simplicity. I think sometimes we make it too complicated when it's really easy. It was God. It was Christ himself opening those seals. Revealing that he was here to open the seals. Showing that the mighty angel had come down with an open book. And I say, thank you, God. I don't need it any more complicated than that. I believe it. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day. God, we thank you for eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, it's so marvelous to us. God, we know that it's by your grace, Lord. There's nothing we've done but absolute grace that you have given us eyes to see and ears to hear. God, some of these things we've looked at for years, for decades, but by your grace, you keep unfolding them to us. And you make them clearer and we understand them better. Well, we're so thankful for that. We just ask, Lord, that you would continue to give us the eye salve that allows us to see you in this day. And God, I pray that you'd help us, Lord, to play our role, to do our part, to not miss what it is you're doing in this day and in this age. But God, may you reveal it to us by your own self. Would you come and reveal it to us, Lord? And may we see, may we see the promise and may we see the fulfillment match. God, it matched in, in the day of John the Baptist. It matched in your first coming. It matched in the forerunner ministry of Brother Branham. It matched in your second coming. Give us eyes to see, Lord, all that you've done in this day. God, forgive us for our intellectualism. Forgive us for our wrong pictures and our wrong ideas. I pray, God, that you'd wash it all away from us now. And God, that we could have your mind on everything and not rely on a past understanding, but we'd be able to take, Lord, the message you've given us, which is the correct interpretation of the word, and may it, Lord, illuminate us afresh, Lord, that we might see your word as you intended it for this day. God, allow that to happen for each one of us. For we love you and we want to see you here. We want to see you now. We want to understand you in the day that we live in. Grant it to us, Father. May we serve you with all of our lives, and may you get glory in our lives. We love you and ask your blessing in Jesus Christ's name.